that we come uh, and gather here for, Lord. I just pray that you'd work in our hearts, Lord. Uh, reveal yourself through your word and, uh, and show us ways that, uh, that you want to be more present in our life. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can take them, turn them to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, where we begin today. You may have been online this week and saw the promotion trailer for the Colossians series. After I watched that thing, I was like, man, I've got, I got a, it's like an epic. Uh, so I got a lot to live up to here, try to make this uh, super thrilling and exciting. I hope we can match the intensity uh, of the little promotion that's been out on, on social media, but I'm excited. Uh, we've done this, we, we do this every now and again, uh, and, and Lord, I just feel has led us to this book of Colossians, which is just so important uh, in our thinking, in our theology, uh, and Paul writes to the church, the saved people in the city of Colossae, and he's going to talk to them about crowning Christ at the center of their life, and that's what we're kind of where we're at. Um, I can hear it in the music. Uh, I can hear it uh, even in the prayers that have been offered up in our service today, how the goal is Jesus Christ and the power is Jesus Christ. How do I get there? It's not my flesh and my strength and my discipline or my ingenuity. My, it, it, is, it is abiding in Christ and letting him be at the center, letting him power me. I'm in him, him in me. Uh, that is the mystery uh, of the Christian life as, as Colossians will uh, talk about in chapter 2. Uh, and then the goal is to know Christ better, to know him more, to experience him uh, now in our life. And I'm so thankful for the transformation that's taking place and the spiritual growth that's taking place in our group as we understand. We've been on this journey over the last, I would say, 18 to 24 months of kind of taking us out of the center of church, taking anything else that's here and putting Jesus Christ in the center uh, where he goes. And that's the journey that we're going to see in the book of Colossians. Uh, and so I know that it's going to be an encouragement that helps you. Today I'm just going to kind of introduce the book, give a few background, and talk through verses 1 and 2. Uh, and then next week we'll start to get in kind of to the meat, uh, things that Paul is wanting to address. But this is going to be helpful information that's going to lay uh, the groundwork for you. Last week, before I get going, we talked uh, about our mission as a church, where we're headed, uh, what Christ commissioned us to do, what he empowered us to do, what he's given us his presence uh, to help us to do his work and that we would do greater things uh, than Christ did when he was on the earth. And we asked the question for everybody, if you weren't here, didn't hear it, I'd love for you to go back and watch that service. We just asked this question, uh, are you in? Do you want to be part of the mission? Because we understand a church is more than just a place that I go and watch someone talk and listen to sing or even participate in those things. But a church is a gathered group of people on a mission with Jesus Christ uh, to experience Jesus Christ. And we asked, are you in? We asked you uh, that little fancy QR code on the front of your seat. Uh, you can click on that. If, uh, and there's a question there at the very top of that little page. It says, uh, are, I'm in uh, sermon decision. And you can click through that. and just has a couple questions for you. This is why I think this is important right now. It's because over the last 14 or 15 months, uh, this world has kind of uh, turned a little bit upside down. You notice that? Anybody, it's just me that's been kind of feeling that way. Uh, and even in our church, a lot of times we just we're kind of like, whoa, where, you know, where'd so-and-so go? Are they still here? I haven't talked in the six months, or I keep getting a text, but I don't ever see them. Uh, you know, where, what's going on? Uh, and even for some of us, I think even if we've shown up week after week after week, uh, if we're not careful, what we can do is kind of get settled and lulled into just kind of, just again, just showing up. And we recognize that from time to time we need uh, our, our we, we just need to be shaken a little bit and encouraged. The Bible word to be provoked uh, and reminded of what we're doing here. Reminded of the mission that we're on. Reminded what where God is at and where He's what He's going, uh, where He's going, and that we want to be with Him and experience and know Him more uh, in a greater way by serving with Him, by responding in faith to all that He's done what he died on the cross for, uh, so that I could obey, so that I could follow him, so that I could be on mission with him. And we've just asked you to think about, maybe there's one area, now look, I don't want any pressure from me to be on you. Like if you say, I don't like QR codes, I don't like filling out questions, I'm not doing it, then that's fine, okay? Uh, and, and I'll probably at some point go, hey, what's, what's your attitude? About? No, I'm kidding. Uh, but I w no, even in that, the, there's a great response, a great opportunity for all of us to grow, because I'm assuming that's why we're here. Or just say, hey, I noticed that you 
refuse. No, I've noticed that you didn't opt in. Oh, I didn't hear about. It. Okay, let's let's talk about that. Or you know what? It's just I'm just not there yet. How, okay, how can I pray for you? I do see this as an opportunity uh, for us to communicate. I do see this as an opportunity for us to be accountable to one another, and I do see it as an opportunity to help us where we're at. To help us to figure out what's next. Where do we need to move? How, do, how does Christ become more at the center uh, of my life as we move forward on this mission of Jesus Christ? And there's a couple of categories as you click through there uh, that we say, man, man, I feel like it's just right now. I just need to show up. I just need to, need to be here every week. And I need to trust Christ to give me the grace. Trust Christ to meet me there and just be in the service in the week. Hey, maybe it's a city group. Maybe uh, you need a smaller community of people that are encouraging one another around Christ and the mission of Christ. And you've been thinking about it for months, but you kind of go, well, it's COVID and I got a mask and I don't have a mask and they don't have a, you know, and we ran out of hand sanitizer, so I can't go this week. And, you know, and we've got a thousand different excuses. This is in some way just a little bit of encouragement to say, hey, let's, let's go. It's probably time to kind of figure out how to navigate in this new normal, and let's just move forward in a way that would be pleasing to the Holy Spirit, in a way that would be dependent on Him, uh, with Christ at the center of that. And so uh, if you haven't done that yet, I want to encourage you uh, to go to that form and, and, and fill that out. Think through that and pray through it. God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to experience you at? Uh, and then if I can be a help in any way, I certainly uh, would love uh, to do that. You know, when we answer the question of Colossians, ultimately what we want to know, what we want to, my prayer for me, my prayer for you is this, is that Christ would be at the center of your life. That we would crown him at the very center of our life. You know, a lot of times, even for people who come to church on Sundays, if we're not careful, Christ can become the accessory of my life. Where he's there, oh yeah, I love Jesus, oh I love, you know, uh, but he really is, it's kind of like if I have time, if I'm in a pinch, if I really need something, then we'll usher in Jesus and have him, you know, like bring him back in and do a few things that kind of get me to feel like uh, I'm on a roll or feel like I've got my feet underneath me or feel like I'm uh, making some momentum in life. And then as I get going, I just kind of push him off to the side. The the reality is we want to keep Christ at the center and, and one of the things that Paul's doing in the book of Colossians is he's just explaining why Christ deserves to be at the center. Uh, how or why he should be there, and then how do we keep him there? The things that we should focus on, the things that we shouldn't focus on. And so we're going to walk through these over the next several weeks. Someone asked me this morning, how long are you going to be in the book of Colossians? Uh, the, the, really, the real spiritual answer is as long uh, as the Lord allows us to be. And doesn't that sound very spiritual? Uh, and proper. We're just listening to the Holy Spirit. No, honestly, I've kind of mapped it out. Uh, I could see how someone could preach about 23 messages from the book of Colossians. Uh, That being said, uh, it may be over in 12. It may be over. It it all depends on how many amens I hear. I figured if it's more amens, you're liking it, we'll take our time. I'm really in no hurry, uh, but like next week, uh, we'll talk about verses 3 through 8, and that's one sentence in, in the original language. It's one sentence And so I'd like to try to keep it into one message and kind of make it a complete thought. But you know how I get sometimes. So let's just kind of dive in here. A little background, a little overview. And what are the, what's the issue? Why did Paul, why did he take his pen and the Holy Spirit say, Paul, I want you to write a letter to the church at Colossae. That'll be, that'll be preserved uh, and and passed down through the generations. It'll be my word, but we're going to address this issue, this thing that's going on. Uh, in the church at Colossae, why did he write this letter? Why did God move Paul to write this letter? Hopefully by the end uh, of today, we'll have that figured out. We want to crown Christ at the center of our life. If you're outlining the book, you could outline it like this. Chapter 1 would be that that we want to, Colossians chapter 1 crowns Christ as Lord of our life. We're going to see that, how he's the firstborn among all the creatures. He's at the top rank of all of this. Chapter number 2 is to crown Christ as life. And that our life is wrapped up, our energy, our power, uh, our ability, what we're living for, the goal, uh, and the power to reach the goal is Jesus Christ. Uh, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we'll appear with him in glory. We'll experience that glory. Uh, That's in chapter 2. And then chapters 3 and 4 sees uh, uh, Colossians crowns Christ as love. And we see this kind of move from the theological Uh, talking about some of these theological things uh, that we'll see in the first two chapters uh, to moving to the very practical, how this looks 
in the modern family of the day of Colossians, and we'll make application to this uh, in our life and in our church, I would encourage you, if you get the chance, the more you read the book of Colossians, even if you're just reading it to be familiar with it, the more this study and this time will be enhanced because as we're talking through things, uh, as I talked to some people that were here Thursday night, they said, I've been reading Colossians and ready for this. And as you said this, it made me think of this verse over here and made me think of that over there. Uh, and just a lot of connections that are going on for them uh, in their mind. And so I'm going to encourage you, uh, if you can, to be reading uh, the book of Colossians. And we'll be in chapter 1 for a couple weeks. So you may not necessarily need to read 3 and 4, but you're certainly welcome to do so. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. That's where we're looking at today. The Bible says this, Paul, an apostle by Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to Timotheus, our brother, verse 2, he says, To the saints and to the faithful, the ones that can be counted on, brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's just where we're going to focus today. Again, just kind of an introduction, uh, like you're writing a letter. Hey, this is Paul. Uh, I've got Timothy here with me, and this letter is to uh, this group of people. So the first thing we see is the authorship of, and that is that Paul is writing this. Now, probably any book in the Bible, if you were to Google it and figure out who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, oh man, you're going to get all kinds of different ideas and thoughts. Uh, who wrote the book of Isaiah? Who wrote the first five books of the Old Testament? I would say almost all books uh, of the Bible, uh, almost all of them, people dispute. Uh, you, you may have noticed this, that people like to argue, okay? People like to be different. People like to have a new, uh, new take on it. For me, uh, a lot of times when I look at, I wonder who wrote this book. Well, I, I sort of just make, you know, when the plain sense of Scripture makes plain sense, uh, seek no other sense, all right? So for me, this is me, I call me crazy, but you know, the first word in the book is Paul. Uh, and, and so I just kind of assume, just, you know, logically here, uh, that it was Paul that wrote the book of Colossians. Now, some people uh, will say differently, and you can research it. If you don't agree with me, I'm okay with that. I'm not going to die over this one, uh, but I do, I do sort of see that in the scriptures. A couple reasons why. Number one is he mentions Timothy. Now, Timothy is like his sidekick. He's a son in the faith. He's a brother in the faith. He's with him on many different journeys. He writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, uh, and he's with them a lot. And so he said, hey, here's, I'm Paul. I'm here with Timothy, and we're writing to the church at Colossae. So that's one of the indications. The other thing is it's very similar to the book of Ephesians. There's a number of times where you'll read through Colossians, and you'll be like, I've heard this some other place, or I've heard it just slightly in a different way. And if you are kind of take Colossians and Ephesians and stick them together, you're going to see some very similar phrasing, some very similar words uh, and things that are going on. And so I think, I think that's because Paul's writing from prison. He's in jail uh, because of his proclamation of the gospel. Uh, and he's headed to Rome. Uh, he's going to appeal his case before uh, Caesar. And we'll see that in Acts 28. Uh, but he's writing to these churches to encourage them. Uh, and this language is very similar. So for me, when it comes to the authorship or who wrote this book, uh, I'm likely to give it to Paul because, one, the Bible says so, and then there's a couple other internal indicators like that. Number two, I want you to see the audience. Who is Paul writing to? And again, uh, it seems kind of obvious, especially if you've been in church for a while. Uh, you know, if it's the book of Thessalonians, it's to the Thessalonican church, the book of Colossae. There's this city uh, in ancient days. Uh, called Colossae, and there's some believers there, and Paul is writing to them. Paul with Timothy writes uh, to the believers, but we're going we're gonna to talk about their geographical location and some of the demographics that are going on in Colossae, but for a moment here at the front, I want to talk with you about the audience, the person, uh, not where they live and maybe what they're encountering in their life, but who they are because of Jesus Christ. Paul's writing to them because they are believers. Paul's writing to them because they've come to know Christ as their Savior. They've received Jesus Christ as their Savior. They've churned uh, from believing uh, in the Greek gods. They've churned from believing in their own religion, or their own self-righteousness, and they've chosen Jesus Christ alone as their Savior. And so Paul kind of describes them almost in implication in these verses, uh, three different ways in which he speaks about them. Uh, but first of all, we see this. He says in verse 2, I'm writing to the saints and the faithful brethren. And here's the phrase or the two words, in Christ. Those who are in Christ. 
The, the thought is here is that what Paul is saying, the first two chapters especially, and if there's ever any hope to practically live it out in chapter 3 and 4 in my life, it really is a big key to begin this within Christ. So many people attempt to be a Christian. They attempt to go to church. They attempt to live a good life, but they, they try to do it in themselves, in their own strength, in their own self-discipline, in their own self-righteousness, and they're depending on themselves and their denomination or their upbringing or some spiritual experience they had or some dream that they had or the fact that they're not as bad as the next guy in order to uh, gain favor with God or to access the blessings of God. Hey, I'm pretty good. God ought to do something for me. Hey, I went to church today. God ought to answer my prayer for a new car. Uh, and, and, we, and we try to uh, get God to do something for us based upon who we are, what we've done. Well, Paul's not writing to people like that. Paul's writing to people who are in Christ. They've come to understand that they can't save themselves, that they can't gain favor with God in their own efforts, that try as they might, and as disciplined as they are, and as faithful as they could be, to attend spiritual gatherings and all those sort of things, that they still come up short of the glory, the holy perfection of God. And so they need a Savior, they need help. And that Savior they've chosen to be Jesus Christ, which is a good choice, because he is the only true Savior. He was God. He became man, who lived perfectly on this earth, died on the cross for you and for me, shed his blood, became sin for us. He who knew no sin so we could be made right with God. He was buried, rose again on the third day to prove that he was God, to prove that he was bigger than your sin, and to uh, complete the offer of salvation uh, and to say, here, believe in me, come to me. I'm the resurrection of life. I'm the bread of life. I'm the door. If you don't come through me, you can't get into heaven. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So here's the way that Paul describes these people, first of all, and most important, is that they are in Christ. They are born again. They are saved, and there's no question, no doubt about that. Can I ask a question this morning? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Are you in Christ? I sure hope so. Look, maybe though you're sitting here and you go, whoa. And I, and like it's, I just showed up, and it's like my first time here, my tenth time here, and like this guy, uh, you know, he's like looking in my mind. The truth is, I, I was trying to be a good person. I was trying to do this. I, I was hoping that if I showed up here today, that maybe, uh, you know, God would do something for me, or I'd get into heaven, or this would be enough. Uh, and, I, and I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad that we're thinking on this together. But those things will not get you there. Those things will not gain you favor with God. Uh, a church attendance won't get you into heaven. It's Jesus Christ and what he did for your life. We're going to see throughout the book of Colossians, there's some people that think, hey, if you do this and do that and do that, that's where this spiritual experience is really at. And all Paul really is arguing uh, through the whole book of Colossians is get all the stuff out of there and put Jesus Christ at the center. And it begins with being in Christ or being saved. Are you saved? If you die today, do you know 100% for certain that your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven? And I sure hope that you do. If you do not, my friend, I want you to know it would be the thrill of my life to sit down and talk with you uh, and help you from the Bible know how you can do that. I also want you to know that I'm not the only one that can do that, okay? Just because I'm up here talking doesn't, doesn't mean I got a corner on this. Most of the people sitting in this room could take a Bible and show you how you can know Jesus Christ and Christ alone as your personal Savior. The most important decision you'll ever make is to stop being in you, stop being in religion, stop being in self-effort, and come to put your faith in Jesus Christ and be in our church. But growing up, all the time, it was confusing, okay? I'm just going to tell you, when I was five, six years old, it was so confusing to figure this out because we'd go to church and my mom would go, hey, Sister Amy, how you doing? Hey, Brother Dan, how you doing? And I'm like, he's a brother, he's a sister, like, I got so many uncles, I don't know, I'm just so confused, you know, like, uh, and, and, and now, in 2021, when you do that, it sort of seems a little cultish, it sort of seems a little weird when uh, people come in, you're like, hey, brother, uh, but you get it, and you understand, if someone does that, don't be weirded out, they're just talking like Paul talked in the Bible, uh, and acknowledging the spiritual reality that when we're in Christ, we're given a spiritual family, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and that is a wonderful thing. Some things we do not deserve, but God has graciously given it to us. Number two, I want you to see that we're sainted. The Bible says, uh, to the saints, verse 2, and the faithful brethren in Christ. So not only are we saved, not only are we siblings in the Lord, but we're also sainted. Now, uh, we live in the great city of St. Louis, okay? So we're kind of familiar with this. You know, someone does so much good in their life. 
Uh, and after they die, uh, someone makes a decision, man, they're so good, let's put them in charge of real estate, okay? And if you need to sell your house, grab one of their statues and bury it in the ground and pray over it do all the things, and that guy's going to help you. He's going to go to God, and he's going to talk to God, and he's going to make that happen where you're going to get your house sold. And we've got a saint for this and a saint for that and a saint over there, and you can never hope to be a saint because, I mean, we'll look at you. But these other people, I mean, they kind of qualify because they're, they're somebody something. Well, here's the, something that I'll throw all that on its head real fast is that the Apostle Paul, <laughs> St. Paul, uh, writes to the saints at Colossae, living, okay, uh, people with issues that we're going to see as we go through, but they're saints. They're saints. Look, you don't have to wait to die to be a saint. You don't have to wait to do something really amazing uh, to be a saint. The reality is the Bible says that when we are saved, that God forgives our sins. He, uh, here's, here's the word in the Greek. It's agios. It means, in other times in the Bible, it's translated holy. It means to separate and to call out from and to put in a special category for a special use for a special reason. In the Old Testament temple, they would have different vessels and cups and, and uh, instruments that were used in the worship of God in the temple. And these were dedicated or holy, set apart. You know, you don't use that china just for every, anybody. It's for that special purpose or that special occasion where it's brought down. It's separated. It's sainted. It's holy. And here's what the Bible says. If you're in Christ, you are sainted. You are set apart. You are holy unto God. God has saved you and redeemed you and covered you with his blood and forgiven you. You're white and whole and purely and to be used for God's glory. That's what our life is for. That's what it was created for. Sin messed all that up. Thankfully, Jesus fixed that. So now if we're in Christ, we're back to that original use. That's the reality. I don't know. I've, I, I know I don't look like it, but I'm a saint because of Jesus. And I have a special calling, a holy calling on my life to enjoy him and to love him and to follow him and to allow him to use me, to flow through me, his love and his joy and his peace and obedience and faith uh, to him and following him. Paul addresses them as siblings. He addresses them as saints. But I want you to see this third one here. He addresses them as being sent. And I, and I guess technically I'm going to say this. He addresses himself as being sent. But there's a great implication here for the rest of us and for them. Uh, in verse 1, Paul says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, the word apostle uh, has uh, this idea. It's from two Greek words. It's from apo, okay, uh, and stello, apostello, apostolos. So there's different ways that this is used. Apostle uh, in the English language. The first word means off. Uh, and are off from, and the second word is send. It means to send off from, okay, to go out. So here's Paul, and he's, in a sense, reminding the church of Colossae who he is. I'm Paul. I'm an apostle. I'm, the, I'm one that was sent off from Jesus Christ uh, to preach the gospel. Uh, Paul has never been to Colossae. Paul didn't start the church at Colossae. In fact, we're going to see a man by the name of, of Epaphras most likely started uh, the church at Colossae. Uh, Paul was in Ephesus, uh, and uh, Epaphras, we're going to get all these E's messed up here, uh, heard about the gospel, got saved, and he takes the message back to Colossae, starts sharing it, people get saved, a church is formed, and Paul writes to them from prison uh, to encourage them and correct this. But the word apostle is used two different ways in the Bible. One, it's used in an official sense. The Bible says that Jesus uh, called 12 to be with him, uh, called him to be his disciples in Luke 6, 13, uh, and then also called them apostles. Like it actually uses that phrase. He said, you're apostles. I'm going to be sending uh, you out. Uh, Paul says of himself that he was an apostle uh, born out of due time, right there at the right time. He, he wasn't with the rest of them, okay? There was the 12, and Judas betrayed Jesus and committed suicide. Here's the 11, uh, and that were there with Jesus during his earthly ministry, that were called out by him, taught by him, sent by him. And then Paul's one that was kind of out of sync. He was out of time a little bit, but he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He spent uh, a, a great deal of time, the book of Acts tells us, with Christ as Christ instructed him, and then he was sent to the Gentiles uh, to proclaim the gospel. And so there is a sense in which 
the word apostle, and I think a lot in our thinking, like we don't usually throw that phrase around or name around. Every once in a while, someone will say, well, reverend so-and-so. Um, I don't even like to throw that name around because the Bible says that God is reverend, uh, and, and it makes, I think it just kind of moves us to almost be something, you know, something we're not, okay? Uh, an apostle, man, that's a, even a big one. Like, I'll save that one for Paul. We'll save that for Bar- Bartholomew and Thaddeus. I don't want that one uh, necessarily in an official sense attached to me. Again, if someone uses that, I don't know if it's the end of the world, but I think there's an official use to it that there was a very select few of these people, because even in the Bible it says the, the, that we follow the apostles' doctrine, the, one, the teachings that Jesus gave to them, that they wrote down from Christ and they're given to us in Scripture. And so I think there is a, a level of respect. I think there is a, a level of selectiveness where there was just a few of them uh, for a number of reasons. That's probably a different message. But there's an ofi- official sense of the term. Uh, and then there's also the unofficial sense of the term in which this Greek word is used a number of times to describe a lot of different people. And just this idea that they're being sent, of Barnabas being sent out, of believers being uh, sent out. Uh, it, it, the idea here is to be sent out by someone with a, a commission, with credentials, with the authority and the responsibility, like from the king saying, hey, I want you to go over there and I want you to tell them uh, whatever, you know. And so there I, I'm going out, I'm sent out from the king to tell this city, to tell this enemy, to tell this other government official, I'm here on official business from the king to tell you this. And that's what Paul's saying. I, hey, I'm Paul, the apostle, the one sent by God. I'm not here on my own, okay? Uh, this, you know, this isn't necessarily how I saw my life going. Uh, and maybe he would, he would think, he goes, I'm not here on my own authority, my own wisdom. I've been sent by God. I think it's important to understand that we too are sent of God, that we are commissioned with each other on a mission with God. First Peter 2 and verse 9, the Bible says we're a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, an unusual or a special people, peculiar people. Why? That we should show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. There was a time we weren't God's people, but now we are God's people. We, there was a time we had obtained mercy, verse 10 says, but now we've obtained mercy. To, the, to what end? It is that we would show forth the praise, that we would be the five-star review for Jesus Christ, that we would shine our lights so that people could see the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. Those who are in darkness, those who are lost, those who are confused, that with uh, with our life as we go, with intentionality, uh, that we would shine for the Lord Jesus Christ. May we always be ready to respond like Isaiah when Isaiah 6, 8 says, I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah responded, Here I am, send me. I think it's always important for us as believers to understand that there is a perpetual sending. There is a perpetual, as you're going, make disciples. As you're going, shine your light. Uh, And this is not just so that someone else comes to know Christ as our Savior, but this is in such a great way how we experience Jesus Christ. Now, you can sit in your recliner all day long and experience Jesus Christ. But there's going to be something you don't experience about Jesus Christ, and that is like when he says, hey, go invite your neighbor uh, and, and ask him over for lunch or bring him to church or, hey, go serve in the nursery or go help with the teens or go uh, put some money in the offering plate or get up there and figure out how you, you know, you, I've given you a good voice. Use it in, in the church service or uh, have a city group into your home or let's support some missionaries. And, and the list, you understand, uh, is endless. Uh, and we go, whoa, I don't know if I can do that. Go, okay, God, I'm going to trust you to that and I'm going to respond in faith. And then I experience the grace of God in my life that enables me to do whatever it is he called me to do. And thus, I experience him. I get to know him more in the fellowship of his suffering and the struggle and the challenges that come with all of those sort of things. Because I'm going. And I'm going because I've been sent. And I can be sent and I can go because of the grace of God in my life. 1 Peter 3.15, we need to sanctify God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man who asks the reason of hope that is within us with meekness and with fear. 
We rely on His Spirit. It's not about me being somebody or me having a corner on it or me knowing the perfect strategy. As we go, we're ready to give an answer to say, hey, this is why I think Jesus is so great. This is why God satisfies. Let me tell you about what He's done uh, in my life. And I do it with a, a spirit of meekness because it's not about me. And I do it with a spirit of fear or reverence knowing that if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, I wouldn't have anything to say. I wouldn't be anybody, uh, and I, I could be in the same mess that someone else finds, so the same spiritual darkness that someone else finds himself in. So I, I, I give the answer in humility. I, I shine the light with a great dependence upon God and understanding that this is all Jesus Christ working through me. As he said in the Great Commission, I'm with you always. As he said in Acts 1.8, uh, you'll receive power from me. It's not from you. Uh, uh, it's, it's from me, and so there's a great dependence on God. The, the secular Greek writer Demosthenes uh, gave this word picture of the word apostolos. Uh, he noted that it was used to describe cargo ships that were sent out with the load. And he also used it to describe the naval fleets as apostles sent out to accomplish a mission. And we've talked about this concept a number of times over the last couple months as we've considered what a church is. But you imagine if, in a sense, if we stop treating church like, hey, I'm going to come in and see what they can do for me, okay, what can happen for me, and if we change the image from that to say, hey, I'm coming in to get the cargo, I'm coming in to be reminded about what's important, I'm coming in to get reconnected to Jesus Christ or to, or to grow in my relationship with Jesus Christ, to be encouraged and challenged by other believers to be led uh, and challenged by spiritual leaders in my life so that I can take the cargo, so that I can take the good news, so that I can take the gospel, and I can go back out to wherever it is that God has commissioned me and sent me and sent our group and sent me as an individual and sent our family so that I can be a light for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm sent, and it's, let me scroll back up here and get the exact phrase, uh, apostle of Jesus Christ. He's sent of Jesus Christ and he's sent uh, by the will of God. The office was not something that he had earned or achieved. It was something that he was given by God's grace. And at the outset of this letter, uh, it is this really, even in the implication of it, it's just this whole doctrine and understanding of grace. Hey, we're saved. We're in God's family. We are saints in Jesus Christ, and we're sent by the will of God. This is God's will. Look, there's some things we have to pray about. There's some things we have to wonder about. There's some things we'll have to discern. But as our mind is changed to be more like Jesus Christ, there's some things that don't need to be computed anymore. Two plus two equals four, and I'm going with the gospel. And as I go in faith, uh, I'll experience Jesus Christ I'll receive uh, his glory. I'll be changed into his image. I'll know him more and more. This is by the will of God, and it's by the grace of God. Jesus himself said in John 15, 16, You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. And to what? Ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask of the Father in my name, I'll give it to you. God has chosen us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and he's ordained it to be so. It is his will that you would go forth and bring forth fruit. And yes, that is his work in you, peace, love, joy. But it is also that that peace, love, joy, and all the Galatian 5 fruits would be, would be spread into other people's life. Because they would say, hey, there's the answer, it's Jesus. And they know that because they've been sent, according to Romans chapter 10, to, pr to preach the gospel. It's his gracious disposition and design. Paul could have spent the rest of his life persecuting the church, killing people who believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and wasting his life, although he would have received many applause, many awards, and much recognition. But God got his attention on the road to Damascus, satisfied his life, and then sent him to spread this same news again and again and again. You are sent by Jesus Christ on mission to shine his light, gifted by God, to go with God. I, I want to say also as a church that we are gifted to go with God 
as a group. I, I think this is so important. Our, our church is, is new to this in many ways, and we're leaning into this, and we're saying, Lord, we, a lot of us have never experienced this before. We don't know exactly what it looks like, but we're praying that you would use us in this way. Uh, and in our city groups, our city groups are praying, and we're saying, Lord, how do we connect? How do we shine your light into this area of our city, into this place? Or what is something uh, that we could do regularly in a way that we would experience your grace as we respond in faith uh, and it would have an impact on other people who need to know the glory uh, of Jesus Christ? And as you get together your city groups, uh, it'd be okay if you looked at each other and just from time to time reminded each other that, hey, you're gifted to go with God as a group. You're gifted to go uh, with God as a group together. And so we're not just here together hanging out. We're not just eating pizza. We're not just talking about the Sunday sermon, sermon especially if you're criticizing it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we are together and enjoying life and helping one another and praying for each other and, and watching each other's babies and baking each other casseroles and reminding each other of verses. Uh, but as we're doing that, why, 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 why? It's so that we can keep going on the mission and experience Christ more and more people know the glory of God. Even Paul, as he was pioneering, uh, went with a group. He mentions uh, Timothy. Uh, there's many others that he was, people that he was discipling, people that he was mentoring, people that he was in a group with, uh, and going uh, as a team together uh, in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. We could say, say like Paul says, I'm Paul, an apostle, uh, and I'm sent by the will of God to, uh, and, and he kind of fills in those blanks. We could say, hey, I'm John, uh, I'm a, a preacher by the will of God. Any Johns want to take that one up this morning? No? Okay. Uh, or I could say, hey, I'm, I'm Ben, an, 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 an encourager. And uh, let's make Ben a giver. Uh, I'm, I'm a giver of, of money in the offering. Right, Ben? There you go. I end up like put him on the spot. No. Uh, I'm Kathleen, an encourager by the will of God. Or uh, I'm Ginger, a, fr a, a friend to someone by the will of God, a supporter, a giver, an organizer, a singer, a, a leader, a helper, a prayer. Friends, we've all been gifted by God. Not everybody has the same gifts. Not everybody has the same callings. But God has gifted you in his spirit as a group to go with the gospel and with God and to enjoy him on this mission. We're not self-made anything. It's his gracious disposition that has allowed us to have this valuable part in history, in his story. We're sent on a mission with God, satisfied, strengthened, and sustained by God. I want to look at verse number two, and I want us just to consider in our time remaining, what's the issue going on at Colossae? Why did Paul get his pen out? Why did the Holy Spirit move him? Why did God breathe these words that Paul wrote down uh, and inspire this letter to the church at Colossae? What's going on uh, in Colossae? Uh, Col uh, there's a map on the uh, screen up there. It'll show you. Uh, that the city of Colossae is about 80 miles east uh, of Ephesus. You can see, everybody remember your world geography class, and there's the boot. Okay, that, what, what uh, country is that? Okay, good. I was, worried I'd, I was worried you'd be embarrassed by giving the wrong answer. That's great. Yeah, Italy uh, is right there, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, we have modern, uh, there's Greece and then Turkey, uh, and that's kind of where we're at in this uh, what would have been referred to in the Bible as Asia, Asia Minor, uh, this modern-day Turkey. Ephesus is on the coast, and about 80 miles or 100 miles inland, we have Colossae. And it was a big city at one time because it ran kind of right in the middle between uh, Ephesus and then the Euphrates River, which would have kind of been over there to the far right of the screen. And so people come through, a lot of traffic, a lot of people saying, oh, this is a good place to stop, let's live here. And so this constant uh, exchange of people, kind of relocating this is a unique mixture of people that come together it was a major city until uh, the times of Paul really Laodicea which is a city we've heard before from the scriptures in Hierapolis they kind of took over those positions like if there was an article written it would be like the fourth best city to live in Asia Minor is Colossae uh, you know in front of it or Ephesus uh, Hierapolis and Laodicea and so it's sort of a dying community as it, as it has been okay in the past but there's a church there, uh, and Paul writes uh, to the church because Epaphras, the one uh, we would believe had took the gospel from Ephesus where Paul was, and he brought it back probably to his hometown 
uh, where he lived uh, and where he journeyed or perhaps just felt, hey, this is a place that could use a gospel witness. Uh, and he's there. A church, people are saved. A church is started. People are on mission now. They're moving forward with the gospel. Uh, Paul, and next week we'll see Paul's heard some good things about these people. God's doing some work and transforming uh, some lives. Uh, but there are a couple issues that Paul is going to get to. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 10, we're told that Paul stayed in Ephesus for uh, two extra years so that all that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And again, that would have been part of that Asia uh, where people would have heard the gospel, would have moved out of Ephesus and into those outlying cities. One of the major false doctrines or teachings that were uh, kind of experienced in Colossae, there's, it's kind of hard to nail it down because, again, there's such this mixture of all different kinds of people that are coming together. But I think the two uh, greatest titles I can give to you, one would be Judaism, okay? The Old Testament law and following all the commands and keeping the Sabbath and, and circumcision and eating you know, certain things. All that kind of was just kept coming after the Christians. It was hard to kind of separate from that. So some of my righteousness, I have to do these things in order to gain favor with God. It's a false teaching that's in there. The other thing that we see is Gnosticism. Uh, and it's just kind of this... Basically, this idea is a postmodern thought of like, hey, truth is not really knowable, so I make up what works for me. And there's just kind of this fusion of these two things, perhaps some other things that are kind of creeping in to the culture, certainly the Greek gods and the worship of the sun and the moon, those sort of things would have, would have kind of played into it. Look, I grew up a certain way, okay? Certain beliefs taught some certain things. Uh, and there's even some things today in my life that I don't think are necessarily wrong, but I just don't do them because this is the kind of way I was used. Or, or I kind of, if I'm not careful, I can really push those things, how I'm used to, what I'm comfortable I can push it and say, this is what the Bible says. When the Bible doesn't really address that issue, but it's just what I've kind of I brought with me to this. And so as we're growing in the Lord, as we're moving Christ more and more to the center of life, these are the things that we want to lead. Because here's the Church of Colossians, they're, they're, they're struggling because they're, people are adding stuff. This is important. This is in the center. This is in the center. And Paul said, no, Jesus is in the center. Christ is in the center. All this other stuff does not matter. We're going to move it to the side. So here, uh, explicitly, he emphasizes uh, that there should be abstinence. Uh, he's addressing these issues. So like in chapter 2 and verse 16, he's the, he says, you guys are saying we shouldn't eat certain foods and certain, drink certain things. And, and that's not the case. Uh, in chapter 2 and verse 16, uh, he also addresses the fact that they are requiring the observance of Jewish feast uh, and Sabbaths and different intervals uh, and different celebrations. He's like, hey, those things had a purpose in the past, but they don't anymore because of Jesus Christ. Uh, there was uh, self-abasement uh, and visions in, in chapter 2 and verse 18, verse 23. They worshiped angels in, chap in verse 18 of chapter 2, uh, either as the object of worship or the subject of worship. Uh, they taught that they needed some kind of worship with a, uh, with a human origin, like a self-made uh, religion type worship, chapter 2 and verse 23. And it praised the value of treating your body severely, chapter 2 and verse 23 of like, you know, in a sense of like cutting yourself and like getting on your bare knees and crawling up the steps and like the more hard stuff you did, then you would gain this new elite level of knowledge and intimacy uh, with Jesus Christ. And although uh, the Christian life may have persecution and may have hardship and suffering, uh, it's, it, our value before God isn't based on how many stairs we can climb on our bare knees. Our value is because of Jesus Christ. We're sainted, we're siblings, we're saved, uh, we're sent, and that's because of Jesus and His grace, not because of any value that I could really add. Uh, implicit in this is that Christ had not had lost his supreme place. And, and Paul's writing this letter to try to put him back there. Uh, he had kind of lost that. There's also this catchphrase that Paul is using in a Christ-centered way, but I think it's in a, in a kind of in like, hey, you think fullness is found here, but I'm telling you fullness is in Jesus Christ. And you think this is where it's at. This is the full thing. This is the whole picture. This is the next level. But I'm telling you, all that we need is in Jesus Christ. Christ. It claimed to promote a higher spirituality. Uh, it uh, required circumcision. Uh, it may have misconstrued the death, burial, and resurrection uh, motif of scripture, uh, and it cast doubt on the complete forgiveness that we find in Jesus Christ according to 
chapter 1 and verse 14. And there's a number of different potential sources from that, a couple that we've already mentioned, and we'll kind of look into that a little bit more uh, in, in the future. It, it attacked the adequacy and the unique supremacy of Jesus Christ. It called into question the fact that Christ uh, was a part of creation. It called into question his humanity. Was he really human? They believe that uh, you know God was so holy that he could... Uh, here, here's one of the things that the, the big proponents of Gnosticism is that they said that anything that was fleshly, material, physical, like you could touch it, it was out there, uh, that those things are wicked, those things are wrong, those things are sinful. Uh, and so Christ or God could have never been a part of creation because it's so wicked, it's so messed up. And so what happens is God's up there uh, in eternity past and he's kind of creating these lesser gods, lesser gods, lesser gods. And the farther, farther away these eons would get away from God, and finally one that was so far away from God, it wasn't really even God, he created earth because he wasn't even close to God, so he, he could be messed up a little bit, and he created this messed up place called earth. Well, God couldn't have anything to do with earth, and so even if Jesus was God and he came to earth because it was a physical dimension, he couldn't actually really be here, so he was here like as a phantom or like as a ghost, so you could see him, but he wasn't really there. And so if he wasn't really there, then here comes some of the problems. Then he couldn't die on the cross for me. He couldn't forgive my sins. He couldn't be buried and rise again. He couldn't be completely God and completely man if these things are going on. And so you can kind of start to see some of the problems or some of the issues that'll, that'll, that are going to be up that he's going to, Paul's going to address. Uh, this was kind of a know-it-all snobbery thing in the sense of like, oh, that's cute. You guys have your... Uh, you know, you guys have your, 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 uh, your kind of faith or trust in God, but here we are on a higher level with this, like, hurting ourselves and these difficult things and these, and these secret handshakes and these initiations that kind of bring us. And it wasn't because they're, it really was, it was sort of a social elite thing where they're trying to, you know, we don't like these people. We're just going to, you know, kind of leave them out on this, and we're going to bring it up here. Here's what happened. When, when flesh... When physical things are wrong, here's two groups that happen. One is you have legalism that comes up. And the other is you have license. And here's, here's what it happened in Colossae uh, and with Gnosticism. One, you have legalism who would say, it's all wrong. I'm not going to touch it. I'd never go there. I'd never do that. I wouldn't have one of those. I'm not going to. Almost uh, kind of Amish mentality in a sense, you know. Uh, and, and now there's all these rules and levels. Well, we can touch this, but we can't touch that because it came from a third generated sort, you know, and you get all these technicalities of legalism. And they look down on people because you used one of those or you went to that thing, you drank that. And so we have this legalistic mindset. And hey, if you want to be like us, if you want to be right with God, then you've got to follow all these rules. And Paul's writing them to the book of Colossians to kind of fix that. Here's the other group that comes out of it. Uh, and that is this is license. Where they just say, hey, we can do whatever we want. Because look, here's the thing. The physical doesn't matter. It's just stuff. It's just created. It's not where the real godly spiritual things are at. So we can do whatever we want because it's, it's the spiritual internal. And not the like Christ changed internal spiritual thing. But like the depraved sinful nature of man. Says, hey, we can live however we want because it's just that. It's just one of those things. It's just, you know, in a sense... It's just stealing. It's just stuff. And it's wrong for them to have it. It doesn't matter if I take it because that's not where real life is at. Real life is on the spiritual level. And so it gave a license to the, some people decided to go with that license route. Just do whatever they want and live like however they want. And so Paul's going to write the, to the church of Colossae. And he's going to help them understand uh, that it's not legalism and it's not license, but in fact there is liberty to be found in Jesus Christ. That as Christ is in us, the hope of glory, he renews our mind. We develop a spiritual discernment that is radically dependent upon Jesus Christ and the leading of the Holy Spirit. We are, in, uh, we are forgiven by Christ and freed so that we uh, can allow him to live through us, so that we can do right, so that we can go on mission, so that we don't have to be in bondage to these sort of things. Sometimes people claim liberty in Christ, I'm free, but then yet you see them in bondage to some 
great things because they've chosen the path of license. You know, that doesn't always look like a drunken man like passed out on the parking lot of some bar somewhere. You know, a lot of times that can look like people who sit in church and they celebrate the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, but everything stops at the cross, and that's a problem. You see, Jesus died on the cross so that he could be in you, so that he could power you to go out and show forth the praise of him so that you could obey, so that you could trust, so that you could kind of connect the dots of what in the world God is doing and why these sort of things happen so that we wouldn't live for the moment and we'd live for something greater in the future. Today we see Gnosticism and it creeps up in a few different thoughts. One is that freedom is found by escaping uh, any natural order. The physical is wrong. It matters what's uh, up, uh, up here, and it's sort of like escaping gravity, although no one's there yet. We're not, I don't think we're really, oh, I don't believe in gravity anymore. Uh, I identify as a person who does not believe in gravity. Not many people doing that one, okay? Uh, but we have issues with identity, issues with uh, creation, uh, and truth and absolutes. This is so Romans chapter 1 where people, when God creates, he reveals himself as a creator and people ignore it and they act like uh, it doesn't happen. They have an issue with uh, the natural order and they're trying to escape the way that God has obviously made things. Secondly, it creeps into a freedom uh, that uh, they believe that freedom is found by looking within. The answer is inside of you. People are basically good. The trumping up of self-esteem and self-discipline. This idea is preached by so many people on television. Hey, there's a champion inside of you. And I don't care how big your smile is. That's not true. Paul said, I know in me, as in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Without Jesus Christ in there, the hope of glory, we got nothing. But Gnosticism and legalism and license even from the church at Colossae, creeps into our world and our churches today, and they look inside to find the answer. Forget what Romans 1, 18 through 32 have to say. They also believe in a fulfillment, uh, a fulfilled human being means obeying your inner feelings, okay? Think about this for a second. The external, the material, that world, it's deceptive. It's tricking you, and it's not really who you are outside it's who you are on the inside truth is relative so like you might say that two plus two equals four but i just don't feel that way today i feel like it's seven and and how dare you correct me how dare you try to, how dare you don't elevate my beliefs and respect my beliefs and uh and not only just like let me go with it now i want you to acknowledge them and confirm them and affirm the fact that i believe it's seven and if not, I'm going to be upset, and I'm going to Twitter about you, uh, and tweet about you, uh, and it's going to be on. It, and here's what's crazy, it blows my mind, is that the stuff that Paul is addressing 2,000 years ago at the Church of Colossae, look, it's no different. It might have an electronic plug to it, it might be slightly more sophisticated, but it's the same base issue where mankind is trying to overthrow God from the center of their life and insert themselves there. Now look, before we start to point fingers at other people, we really got to start with ourselves because this is a battle that we face uh, and can face on a, regular, on a regular basis. We, feelings give us our identity uh, and we express ourselves to be fulfilled. You do you. And that's how you'll be fulfilled. You do you is sort of the message. And it's not about who God made you to be and how the world actually works and the truth that we find in Jesus Christ. It's about whatever you've really made up on the inside uh, and whatever you uh, feel. We ignore God as creator. And, and fourthly, uh, being human, the, the thought of present-day Gnosticism uh, is that being human means creating your own identity, even if it means erasing the identity that you've been given. In the past we have taken for granted what we have been given, like our background, our family, our sex, our race, our culture, our nationality. And we've just, hey, you've been given this. Make the most of it, all right? We're, you know, 
And that's how, that, let me just say it this way, I hate to burst anybody's hope. That's how life works, okay? That's how God created it. Uh, and mankind has made an absolute uh, mess of it all and trying to overthrow God and trying to put themselves at the center. That's where all the mess uh, comes from. Uh, and, and the thought here today is that when internal and external conflict, uh, or when there's a internal and external conflict, meaning that what's obvious on the outside and what is I'm feeling on the inside is that conflict, then we change the external because that's the physical, that's the evil, that's where it's wrong, and the internal has to be right. Now look, the heart is deceptive above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Even so much so that people will go to great lengths to change what is obvious. The way that they were made to acknowledge God as their creator and acknowledge his sovereignty and who he made them to be and where he placed them on this earth, and what family he placed them on this earth. God is not trying to create for any of us right now heaven. But he's prepared heaven, and he's given himself to redeem you from this broken, messed up, wicked place. Amen. Truth, certainty, reality in Jesus Christ can set us free. There is liberty in Jesus Christ not to be in the bondage of license to sin, not to be in the bondage of legalism where we are constantly striving and working to gain God's favor, but where we can rest and thrive and enjoy and relax and produce, uh, the spirit, God can produce his spiritual fruit through us as we go with him through life. Throughout the book of Colossians, you'll see things like this. Colossians 1.9, Paul's going to pray that they're filled with knowledge that they increase in the knowledge of God. That we get this straight. Like that's what's going to fix this thing. He says in verse one, in, or chapter 1 and verse 15 uh, that we are in the image of God. Uh, that God, Christ was in the image of God. In verse 16 that he created all things. In, in verse 19, uh, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, in verse 15 that he's the firstborn. Uh, not meaning that he has the high priority. We'll look at that. Uh, in a couple weeks and then chapter 2 and verse 10 that we are complete in him look if you come to church thinking hey i started with jesus because i know i got it saved i, I asked jesus my savior i asked him my heart and now pastor matt like tell me what to do Here, here's what i'm gonna i just want to tell you to do go back to jesus <laughs> stay with jesus because he's not just uh first base you know it's first and second and third and home it, it's jesus it's not just a diving board to jump into the pool of spiritual living in Christian life. Uh, he is the diving board, yes, but he's also the pool. And we'll swim around in Jesus uh, all of our life. Understanding, here's Paul writing a book, basically another angle at which he would say to people who are trying to shove their stuff to the center and say, no, get it out because this is all about Jesus Christ. Don't be deceived. Christ deserves to be king at the center of your life at the center of your satisfied, fulfilled, joy-filled, grace-filled, love-filled, secured life, you'll find Jesus Christ and nothing else. This is the truth. It's not just truth for me, not just truth for you. It's truth for the whole world. Let's close by saying this. Not, not zip up your Bible close, but just uh, here it is. Number one, material matters. Material matters. The spiritual life uh, it, the, the truths uh, are absolute and knowable in Jesus Christ, okay? It's not just about what's thinking in my head. There's some, you know, outwardly what I do, the way I live, how I respond to people, how I treat people, uh, what I do with the physical part of this world, uh, material matters. There is a right and there is a wrong. There is a faith and there is obedience. And Christ alone can give you liberty uh, from license and legalism. Secondly, Christ is king. He's not an accessory. He's not a starting point. Jesus Christ is everything. And as we're going to see in two weeks, Paul says a prayer for the church of Colossae because I'm praying that you'll grow in understanding this. Because like maybe you came to church today and you think, man, I'm really disappointed. I just needed those three tips to get me through the week. 
And all, all Paul's going to say to you, and all I want to say to you is, no, you don't need three tips. You need one, and it's Jesus. Look, I know you'd like me to tell you, hey, if you'll just put $100 in the offering plate every week, and if you'll just light 47 candles, and if you'll take that bead, and you'll put it from there and put it over there, you're going to be squared away. But that's not how it works. First of all, it's nothing about Jesus. It's all about you. It may make you feel good. It may make you feel superior. It may make you feel like you can do whatever you want. But that's not what God is promoting. That's not truth. Christ is king. And he is everything. And we keep coming back to him. Thirdly, in Christ, praise the Lord, we are siblings, we are saints, and we are sent because we are saved. We are in Christ. This is the opportunity to praise him. And to thank him. Look, this is, I, I know you watch a, a minute and 12 second trailer on Facebook and think, man, this, is, this series is going to be awesome. Uh, and then we come today and it's the introduction. This is like names and locations. And here's the background of this. We're going to get into the good stuff. But I hope this is an encouragement to you. I hope this is a challenge. Begin to think about this. Hey, am I in liberty? Or perhaps am I, in some area of my life, I'm in the license. Or maybe in the legalism aspect. Do I don't give enough thought to my material life and the things around me? Because it does matter how I spend my time. It does matter what I do with myself. It does matter how I talk. These things ought to reflect Jesus Christ in my life. And then do I understand my calling? Do I understand God's will in my life as a sibling, as a saint, as a sent one of Jesus Christ? I'm gifted by God to go with, go with him as a group, as a church. And I pray that we would respond faithfully to the Lord as he's worked in our heart today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these simple truths. I know we've taken a little longer than normal. I didn't want to preach two introduction messages. Lord, would you help us just to keep gathering around you? We sing about you. We pray to you. And then we get into the word. May it show us you more. Lord, would you help us this week to recognize that you have a truth and it's found in Jesus Christ. There is a fullness found in Jesus Christ. May, may we live as a family member of God, as a saint, as a sent one <laughs> that has you at the center. Lord, show us where we might spend a whole day or a whole week trying to find fulfillment in something other than you. And Lord, when we see that, may we respond in faith and just turn back to you and trust and dependence and rest in you and then experience your joy and filling and peace and love. Lord, would you, I pray with the Apostle Paul that you would grow our knowledge of Jesus Christ as we spend time around this precious book of the Bible. And we ask these things in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. If I can talk with you, pray with you, I'm going to slip to the back as we sing here in a minute. I'd love to talk with you even after the service.